So the first thing I want to know is, Chief Zabu, I am very familiar with, and it's part the Mystery Science Theater 3000 love that you've gotten. It's part the legacy of variety. It comes from a lot of different places. But somebody right. who just clicks over to the IMDb page, it says it's a 1988 movie. And we know that is not correct. And <laughs> perhaps the story of the production of the film is more interesting than the film itself in the long run. I'm right. curious when it became not annoying, but like funny and awesome, the fact that you had this movie that was more famous for the production than the movie itself. Well, I, I think Neil can, uh, can tell you better than me because I'm, I wasn't aware to the extent and degree that the thing was taking off. What I did uh, feel with Neil is we really were a week away from opening in New York, in LA, and, and the, the company was, a, was a, a very decent independent company, and we really were very happy. Not as happy as we would have been or could have been. For example, they didn't have the name Chief Zabu, which is what we wanted. They decided to change the name to Rich Boys, <laughs> because of those two boys and that wonderful song. So there were a number of things. I'm just giving you one big blatant one. But right. all of a sudden, bingo, these guys went into bankruptcy. And if you know anything about bankruptcy, every asset that somebody holds is held down and looked at. And it just got into a whole mess. Right. He was writing. Neil was writing all kinds of things. I had deals galore. So after uh, many months of thinking, what are we going to do next? We went on to do other things, each one of us. But we kept the name alive in variety for about a number of years, so three years probably, from the time we made the movie to the time we stopped. Because we really expected to get out and into the uh, public side. Finally, we didn't. And we just went our separate ways. And believe it or not, we had a dinner one evening. And as we were sitting together, as we sat down, we looked at each other and said, you realize what happened today? And Neil said, I think so. <laughs> it's hard to believe. But the answer was, this is, this is in um, 2000, July. 2015. June 16th. June yeah. 16th, uh, uh, 15. 2015. Right. It's the day that this guy, our president, announced his uh, uh, participation in the election for president. And we looked at each other and we could not believe it. And then we began a journey that should have been filmed by itself. And that <laughs> is trying to find the negative. And man, it wasn't easy. We went every place. We, the lab had closed. We Go ahead. Yeah, but we, we looked at each other at dinner and said, we made a movie about a New York real estate developer who wants to have political power. We have to find our film. So in the course of us finding an old VHS tape so we can look at this movie, it's not something that was causing us pain. We talked about, oh, we should look at the movie at some point. We never did. Zach and I happened to be walking down Ventura Boulevard mm -hmm. uh, in our continuing conversations, and we see somebody about your age walking towards us, and he's got a t-shirt that says, Zach Norman is Sammy and Chief Zabu. <laughs> and we go to this guy, and we go, what the I, fuck, man? Because <laughs> we didn't know anything about Mystery I, I Science nothing. Theater. It was, we, and the guy said, Mystery Science Theater. And then he realized he was talking to Zach Norman. So that right. blew his mind. And the guy said, oh no, this is like the biggest thing on Mystery. And they sell t-shirts that say, Zach Norman is Sammy and Chief Sabu. And if you go to the internet, you'll find T Public, Zach Norman is Sam, somebody selling t-shirt. So we said, well, I guess some other people have heard of this movie, <laughs> aside from us. We thought nobody except us knew that this movie had once wanted to exist. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that that impossible as it was, and then looking thirty years later, because we wrote this thing and we we fashioned this character on a guy by the name of Trump, who had <laughs> built this big building three years before we shot. And he was gone. He was all over the place. He was everywhere with his madness for us. And, and we just had this Alan Garfield doing his number and we treated him accordingly as far as I'm concerned and Neil is concerned. But that was all forgotten. It was so impossible to comprehend, right. to believe that 30 years later, this man is going to run for president. <laughs> Never mind become the president. That was right. not even in the cards. Because by the time we, but the biggest thing of all for me is when we looked at this picture 30 years later with two different guys. Of course. We lived 30 years. And we took a picture that was almost 90 minutes long when we had it in, by the way, we found it underneath my cellar downstairs in the basement because the lab had gone out of business and I got the negative and buried it somewhere. No outtake, so all we had was the negative, yeah. Yeah, we just had the negative. We had no outtake, so all we had to work with was the finished film. So in looking at the film, we were different people. So we saw things that we didn't see 30 years before. And we made at least 15 minutes at minimum of cuts and and then not to jump ahead we i mean we just got it in time to get a quick week in uh, la to qualify for award season and then the 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 thing that you see in the movie mm -hmm. was our final cut which now four years after that with this guy having done the job he's done and running for re-election, we then did another cut. And ironically, we finished that cut on April 7th, the very day that poor Alan Garfield died. Mm. So it was a head trip. But here we had not one, not two, but three different cuts. And, and, and the final one was this year. And, and it was great because we couldn't go to those outtakes and we couldn't go through all that. We, we had to deal with what stuff we had. And move some things around. That's right. That's right. And we did. And, and make it and, the honor of a t-shirt like this. You know? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were I wondering why is the man going that. off camera? What is he doing? He's, no. he's pulling the t-shirt that says, Zach Norman is Sammy and Chief Zach. <laughs> I wasn't wondering that for a second. I was wondering, man, people think that I have a lot of stuff on the walls. That guy has a lot of stuff on the walls. Both of you, and I mean that in a great way. I, I, one of the things I love about the Zoom interviews is you actually see where people are working at it. Yeah. And yeah. maybe the first week or two, people were able to hide uh, yeah. stuff, and they were able to look yeah, at yeah, like yeah. Uh, everything was unkempt and they were minimalist. No, I like no. to see what the creative people like yourselves actually have up. So, yeah. wow. well, I was, I was admiring your background, to be very honest with you. You got a big space and beautiful books and all kinds of good stuff. Now, are oh. you at your home? And are you at your home? The home in Long Beach, New York. Um, oh, Long Beach. Oh, you know, I went there every summer as a kid. I mean, that's where I lived. And so when you say Long Beach, New York, and my dearest cousin lives right up the road from you in Lido, right. I mean, it's just, the, it's just the most wonderful, wonderful place. Long, I, I could smell that salt air as I'm talking to you. Well, I, I want you to know, I also smelled the salt air, but I was outside of Boston. <laughs> and boy, did it smell where I was. I want you to know. I grew up in a rough, tough city. I, I grew up in Boston. Jumping off from what Zach said, you know, we've both lived our lives. We're not, we, we weren't tormented by what happened to Zabu. It was kind of melancholy because we knew we had a, a, some great performances and a cool story there if we could get it right. 
so the idea that a couple of filmmakers can revisit their movie over mm -hmm. 30 years with the public not having right. seen it <laughs> was so interesting from an artistic point of view. And then to have a guy like, you know, the, the, the Hollywood Reporter give it a, a, a wonderful review and Peter mm -hmm. Bogdanovich weighing in and giving, and these academics at UCLA weighing in. I mean, yeah. it's such a delight for us that, uh, it, you know, we hope that some people will have equal amount of fun taking this 73 minute ride. It's right. 74, by the way. Oh, because me. once yeah. we get. Once you get, when you get a certain age, you know, you try to round it you, off. You try to take some now. time off, you know? 734 means 74. Yeah. Well, then I have a follow-up question to something that Zach said. When he found it in his cellar or under his cellar, did you find anything else good when you were doing that digging? Oh, I did. I did find some things. I threw them out, though. <laughs> and here's this the one I didn't story. throw out. So we had cut the movie. Uh-huh off a digital transfer from a fourth generation VHS tape. Wow. So now when we were done cutting the movie, uh, the poor person who was our editor, you see over the years, our mindset was the 1980s. And in our mindset, if you wanna recut a picture, you gotta get an editor with a oh. movieola in a room and it's gonna cost you $200 an hour, maybe $200 a day. Lo and behold, we find you can get a unemployed actor who's got a laptop to cut your movie for $200 a week in their place in North Hollywood. So, you, you know, we, we cut the movie and when it's done, she says, you know, you can't show this movie to human beings. And we go, why not? And she said, well, it's kind of like looking through three terrariums. I mean, you can see what's going on in the movie, but it's like five generations. It's all green. You got to find the negative and we got to transfer the negative to digital. So we find this negative and she says there's only one place that does the that does 35 millimeter anymore. It's Photochem in Burbank. Mm -hmm. So Zach takes it to, to Photochem and the head of photo, and, and we say, we don't have any money, man. You got to understand, dude. <laughs> we tell him the story of this thing. And the guy thinks it's so funny. He says, listen, even though you're an aggregate 143 years old, you are legitimate first time low budget indie filmmakers. So I'll give you the student rate to make the transfer. That's right. That's right. So wow. these two That's little That's how guys, we were able to afford to transfer it to digital, match the cut and get it out there. Yeah. I mean, entertainment is full of lost albums and lost yeah. movies coming oh, out 30 right. years later. Like, if you're a big Beach Boys fan like I am, the Smile album took right. 35 to 40 years to finish. And yeah. Wow. There's wow. a Guns N' Roses album that took 14 years. Uh, it's, it's impressive that you finished this uh, against... 34 Obama. years later, that's all. But so, do you uh, have... Other projects that never got finished that you're starting to think about? That's so funny you asked that. So I've got this <laughs> book called American Gargoyles that mm -hmm. uh, is a book I wrote and illustrated about the gargoyles on an Art Deco building in New York. Mm -hmm. And a guy is going to knock down the building and put up a big skyscraper. The gargoyles have to figure out how to save their building. It came out last year, got a great review in the New York Times. Somebody is optioning it, a media company now to, to do something with these characters. I started that, I think, in 2002. <laughs> wow. So you kids out there, <laughs> what you want to do, the key to success is to not drop dead. <laughs> That's a big one. He's absolutely right. You know, because, man, I want to tell you that this movie was a wake-up call to me in the cutting that we did, the first cut after the 30 years, the different perspective that we had, that we weren't really, at least certainly I was not, that conscious of. I was aware that I was different, but not to the extent and degree this stimulated in me. Now, I happen to have a little luck because being an actor, at 17, I followed a tall blonde woman across the campus and she went into the theater and I followed her. And they asked me, 
what have you done in the theater? And of course, I used to be a drummer in a right. band. So every nightclub I worked, I said, I worked the Frolic Theater. I worked the Coronation Theater. Every club I said I worked. But in the first play I did, the guy said to me, why did your character go across the stage? And I looked at him, I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> and then of course he said to me, what was the motivation? <laughs> Another word I never heard of before. Right. So my life began really as an actor. And once I got into, and I won't go into the story, but I got into a place where somebody suggested that I go and see a psychiatrist. <laughs> and I looked at this person, I said, if I may, since we don't have a big audience right here, said anybody goes to a psychiatrist, I was told my whole life by my father is full of shit. <laughs> So I said, you know, these guys are full of shit. <laughs> That's what we do. We repeat what we hear. We grow as we live. Right. And then these things just changed my life. And slowly I began to say, after five years, I'm studying with Sandy Meisner, who was a famous teacher. Right. Next to me is John Voigt in class. And I said to myself, is it possible that I'm a character in my own life. And maybe I'm doing things for reasons I'm not aware of. And man, it's so true. But unfortunately, so few people get it, know it. We all, I watch my grandchildren and I see that they are growing up just as their parents have now, be careful. Out. People may be watching this thing. Zach. No, no, no. I understand. But the point is <laughs> that you want to try to spread out a little bit. It's not sure. just, I, I just picked my family, but it's every family. Sure. This is what you learn. This is your, 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 your world. And man, I found out a lot of different things. So when we came back those 30 years later, it was such a heavy trip. I don't think we had one disagreement yeah. about what to change. And we no. changed a lot. Really? A lot, a lot of stuff we were, a we lot. fought over and convinced and that's how it had to be. And then when we both looked at it together, with we said, look, okay, that out, that out, that out, that out. I mean, it was blatantly obvious, unfortunately. So maybe it was fortunate because I think if the picture was released when it was released, it then wouldn't be released after a while and that would be the end of it. Yeah. But now I think it's going to have life because it truly was based. This real estate guy was based on the real estate guy who's the president of the United States. And that is no bullshit. I mean, I happen to have been introduced to my wife by the woman that became the wife of Donald's brother, Robert. And she was his wife for 25 years. The famous I, socialite Blaine Trump introduced Blaine Trump, she was life. the doyenne of New York City for yeah. all those years that she yeah. was uh, swinging. Wow. So, I mean, there's all kinds of connections here. But the best connection in the world to me is to watch these poor people, me included, functioning <laughs> the way we do function in this movie. Because it's, it's, it's not conventionally funny. It's behaviorally for me. Yeah, the picture is really a snapshot of a kind of filmmaking that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, a, cer a certain kind of committed type acting, comedy, storytelling. And also when it comes to making an indie movie, for lack of a better word, some preposterous ambition. Uh, Zach, you know, had made many, oh. many, many movies as an actor, as a producer, as a right, presenter, right. as a financier. Uh, Zach financed the release of Hearts and Minds, which won an Academy Award for Best Documentary, and some people said was instrumental in ending the Vietnam War. But we One were never third of the people, by the way, <laughs> and, and, and and we were 
we were unaware that when you make your first low budget movie that's going to have a 15 day shooting schedule, you're not supposed to have 43 speaking roles, 22 locations, <laughs> purportedly take place in three cities and two continents. <laughs> that's well, that's right. how you make your first movie. It should have, and maybe it should have 45 people, and you know? Darren, yeah. Darren, I must interject one thing just privately between us is <laughs> where did Tibaraku come from? <laughs> Tibaraku was my, uh, what do you call it, that weekly thing? Timeshare. <laughs> timeshare. That was on my timeshare on St. Croix. Oh, so really? we went down there and shot Tibaraku. We did a as day in Tibaraku. As, as, as we did every single scene in this movie, we spent a day and a half in New York City. We're uh -huh. shooting outside the Plaza Hotel, and you walk into Bard College. Yeah. Because every interior was in that college. Wow. So it was just wild, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Even the Tibarakan thing, when he was sweeping up, he, we had him sweeping up at Bar. <laughs> yeah. Is Wikipedia correct that it would, the budget was around $182,000? It wasn't, it was $187,900. <laughs> <laughs> Nine. One hundred and eighty-seven thousand nine hundred dollars. That's what I remember. So, if that's in you know nineteen eighty-six, nineteen eighty-seven money, obviously that's seven hundred thousand dollars or something like something that. Something like that, I would think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, when all the money is spent like that, and you get a student rate kind of deal on the film transfer, and it's just kind of uh, sweat equity, did that make the film go profitable? immediately upon coming out on video on demand? Absolutely, I don't know. Because <laughs> I haven't seen, I haven't seen the numbers. I don't know where, I, I wrote an email today asking, when do we get the numbers? When do we start to see the numbers? But you know, Neil and I, I think are pretty uh, realistic. Yeah. And it's, it's more important that people see it, like it, and get affected by it in one form or another because it is behavior you're watching. And yeah. man, I, I was in the real estate business and I went in the real estate business when I found that all my clothes and my tape recorder were in a hock shop. And I was living at the corner of 54th and Broadway in New York at the Bryant Hotel. Yeah. And I had a beautiful uh, bathroom in the hall. <laughs> right. You see? So all of a sudden I decided I'm going into a cousin of mine was in the real estate business and he gave me a job and uh, I won't go into the detail of it, but I will tell you, he, he bought five buildings and mm -hmm. he fixed up one apartment in each building. There were 12 apartments in each building. So he said to me, you're an actor, act here, call up these banks. So I called up about 113 banks. Uh, three people came to see this guy's new place and each one I took in the front door and I said let's just look at any apartment and I opened the door brought him in and showed him this beautiful new kitchen new bath and I did that to five buildings and then I went around the back and I took him in the back door and I said let's take a look at another one and we went into those so everything I did went to that movie because that's what I learned in the real estate business. And that's what Donald Trump, as I watched him, taught me. Right. Staging apartments, staging that's it. Staging the whole game, man. I mean, why he only did business with Deutsche Bank, I can't tell you. Neil can, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I mean, waiting for the last subpoena. A lot yeah. of and this guy, how many presidents have had the amount of bankruptcies that this man has. Uh, obviously, the answer is zero with that one. Yeah. Zero, zero, zero. You got it. I got so, you. Oh, I was going to throw you guys a compliment with, with all this, if you didn't mind me interrupting there, Zach. Please, I, I am one. <laughs> interrupt me. Okay. So Neil <laughs> held up that shirt, and I see you got some merch in the background there, Neil. Right. Most people that would be in your position where you discovered that something was done all that uh, done without your consent and people were quote unquote bootlegging, most people would immediately go, well, I'm going to call up some IP lawyers and we're going to collect. You guys took the opposite route of yeah. embracing 
and being yeah. psyched that all these people were embracing your stuff over the years. Well, you know, why not? I mean, they're putting the word out. What we want is for people to, 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 to see the movie. I mean, uh, there's nothing stopping us from putting a T-shirt out if we want to. But if somebody wants to go to the, the effort to have somebody walk around a mall advertising our movie like it's 1922 and Max Sennett's got somebody with a sandwich board walking <laughs> down Broadway, that's fine with me. Um, uh, so... Uh, yeah, well, it, it, I had an easier one. I didn't realize I was being made fun of. <laughs> I didn't get it. So I said, well, my Oh, yeah, God. let me jump in on that for a second. <laughs> so, oddly enough, the mystery science theater people right. who watched the show have reached out for us. Can I get yeah. a poster? Can you sign something? Can you write me a note? And we're happy to do. We've heard from people in Oregon. We've heard from people down in Texas. It's terrific. But the actual people of Mystery Science Theater have given us a total stiff arm because when they found out it was actually a good movie, that the Hollywood Reporter had written about, that the New York Times had written about, that Peter Bogdanovich had, all of a sudden it was, what? What? Well, and, they, and they refused to talk to us. No, they, they are talking now, I'm yeah. told. And, and uh, it's, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're pretty, uh, got a pr pretty good sense of humor about yeah. how good the movie is and what yeah. happened. I mean, we really got mutilated, but we didn't know it, so it's okay. <laughs> it, it happens. I mean, take the movie Showgirls, for example. Yeah. That uh, movie was mutilated, and nowadays it's a cult classic that <laughs> won parodies, and people go, it, it's actually not that bad. It was just a yeah. temporary career killer for everybody involved. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, didn't, uh, it didn't affect my career or Neil's career. Yeah. Right. I'm not talking about showgirls. I'm talking about <laughs> In fact, it helps me. You know, I go into a meeting and uh, you, you could see how old I am. And you walk into a meeting at a studio and it's like, what's this old guy doing here? And then it's like, they look at and they go, oh, he's the cult guy. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, come on, sit down, have a cup of coffee. As, as long as you could get a frame around who you are. So, that, so I'm happy to be pigeonholed as the cult guy. Yeah, yeah. My problem is they think I'm very young. <laughs> well, you're vintage, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Anyway, I, I won't take my teeth out. I'll just keep looking at you. Uh, I do that with the grandkids. I go like that, the teeth pops, and everybody goes nuts. <laughs> so... <laughs> Put that in the next movie. Uh, I, I think that you guys need to be on the Gilbert Gottfried podcast because I can't think of a better fit than, than this. If you could connect us, we're happy to do it. I'll do we'll some go, research go for you. Yeah, yeah do great. Anything. He would be but so much fun. He would, he's got a sister who lives up near a, a, a little place my wife and I have up in uh, Ulster County, up in the Hudson Valley. So I've never met her, but I know he's got a sister up there because he often visits her and will play a club up there on a, on a certain night. Uh, so uh, he, he would be hilarious to deal with, yeah. Sure, so That's is awesome. there anything besides the movie that you guys want to plug or besides American Gargoyles that we haven't covered that really people should know about? I would just love to keep them focused on Chief Zabu and tell them for, for three ninety nine or four ninety nine they're going to have a, a a good time and they're going to find something I think that they're going to like or they could argue about. And for nine ninety nine they can own it forever and show it to all their friends. <laughs> so it's it's a joyful trip to yeah. to get here finally after all this time. Absolutely. For the price of so one the, drink at a bar these days. For exactly. <laughs> That's right. And, yeah. you know, it's been so much fun to meet folks like you. I, I, you know, the, this weird internet thing. You meet somebody, you see what they're doing, you reach out, they reach back. And, you know, now I'm talking to, a, a, you know, a smart guy who loves film, who loves music in Long Beach, Long Island. I mean, this is the greatest thing. It is the, terrific. The pleasure is all over here. So two quick questions, and then you guys are free back to doing what it is you're <laughs> going to be doing. And the first one is, Zach, 
Is yeah. the story true about you buying a Basquiat for three grand? Uh, it actually $3,200. And not only, not only did I buy one Basquiat that year, I bought five of them. Wow. Okay, five. I had no idea. I started to paint the, when, uh, in 76 and came across Basquiat in uh, 81 and then, and then went to his place and I looked at the, 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 the art and I really dug it. It really was where my head was. Never thinking about the future. I didn't buy it because for any other reason. But it's true, and uh, uh, the one I bought for thirty two hundred sold in sixteen, I think, for um, uh, twelve twelve million pounds, something like that. And of course, his his uh, one that he made the same year sold a year or two later for a hundred and ten point uh, five million dollars net. So it's unbelievable. I also got Keith Herring too. Really? I dug him and bought him. He wrote out to me and my wife to Zach and Nancy and did a beautiful thing with it. And uh, so I was, uh, I just had a, a, a no background. There was one picture in my house, one on a wall. And it was a, a reproduction reprodu of Sir Walter Raleigh <laughs> walking across uh, a, uh, uh, taking a woman across a uh, Mud. Uh, a piece a puddle <laughs> with a rug on it, and that was it. So that's how I got the Basquiat. <laughs> I don't know how you top a story like that. You <laughs> I don't even think try. That. No, <laughs> no. So it, it's kind of like that in a way ties into the movie in that it's all these hilarious coincidences that you guys did genius-like things over and over and over again without realizing that you were doing genius things. Do I have that uh, correct? I don't know about the genius things, but certainly unique, different mm -hmm. kinds of things. And for me, the revelation was really, the, the biggest revelation was this 30 years later and recutting Zabu. Yeah. Because then it, we were sitting there and understanding not just about the picture, but mm -hmm. about who we were 30 years ago. And that's the joy of the thing that I'm doing next. And I'm really excited because I couldn't get there until we got Zabu on the platform. And that is, I hate to say the word, uh, but my memoir. And I want to lay this down. It used to be... Uh, to make some money, it used to be to have some fun, but now it's to tell six people, and maybe seven people will get it, and have have a, an addition to their life, and that's where I'm at, at Ochenta. Yo hablo español. Puedo hablar español contigo. Yes. Cinco cinco años en escuela, no comprende. Ah. <laughs> Five years in school, uh, can't I understand. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Zach, that wisdom, I can't top that. Neil, the pressure's on you. Anything to add there? No, just, you know, the, the, the word of wisdom that I've come to is if you're in the arts, just try to, try to do something you want to do for you. You know, the, the chances are of chasing a market. It, it, it's a crapshoot, whatever you're doing. It's a lottery. So you might as well do, whether it's a painting, poetry, writing, mm -hmm. making a movie, do something that you feel speaks to who you are. And it, you maybe have a shot to be happy that way. May I just interject one word, which is Please. my favorite word in life now. Yeah. And yeah. that is this. The word is consciousness. Mm -hmm. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? That's really something. Yeah. And that's what Zabu did. A lot of help in my life and in Neil's life. I can uh, stress enough that everyone's got to see Chief Zabu. <laughs> Thank you guys for your time. Thank you so much, man. And this has been such a delight. Whenever yeah, you're in Long Beach, New York, Long Island, New York, dinner's on me. You just come out here, okay? You got it. Thank you, man. You got so it. Much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.